The whole world is sick. Are you worried about America? I am. Believe the impossible and you can do the incredible. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of The Catholic Patriot. I'm your host, Dr. Peter Howard, and I'm thrilled to have back as a guest with us today Professor Daniel O'Connor, who joins me from across the, the other part of the, of the nation in New York, where I'm in northern Idaho, and it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to have him. There's a lot of things I can't wait to get into with him as we bring 2000, or 2021 to an end and uh, really get our, our orientation to 2022. So without uh, any further ado, I want to welcome Daniel to our show. Welcome, Daniel. Hello, Peter. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be back across the nation here from the, uh, the communist nation of New York. <laughs> I'm, sitting, I'm sitting here envying you being in a, in a more sane place of Ohio. But uh, anyway, Ohio. I'm surviving here. How about you? Ohio. <laughs> I'm from New York. We don't know anything about the states. Ohio, Idaho. Idaho, Idaho. 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 It's, it, they they <laughs> almost rhyme. I think. <laughs> no, I just discovered no. today, as we were talking before the episode, that he's three hours behind me. I didn't even realize that Idaho was in that time zone. So now I know. I learned something today. Yeah, there we go. Well, speaking of time, you know, I uh, I want to encourage everybody who may have missed the first interview that we did back in the uh, early summer, which. Uh, was extremely well received, very popular. People from all around the world were able to watch it and share their own comments. And uh, to see that message that we'll, we're going to basically continue that conversation tonight of understanding the signs of our times and, and what should we should be doing that, about them as Catholics. Um, I want to encourage you to go back and watch that episode. It really is a, a good kind of a part one, and you'll begin to realize, too, that what we're talking about then is already you know, it's already been fulfilled and we're moving forward. So you can, you can always check what we talk about real time. Um, but, you know, one of the things that got me to uh, bring Daniel back was that he just recently published a new book, and I'm very excited to get my hands on it, and it's called Thy Will Be Done. And I'm going to put that on the screen right there, right in the middle. There's a, a little small version of it, and I'm sure Daniel's got a probably a hard oh, copy. Oh, yes, I do. I do. I, I admit I do have my book. Yeah. Glued to his hand right there. So, th <laughs> so there it is. Thy will be done. And as you can see, don't don't worry. It's not as big as my as my my <laughs> crown of sanctity book. So it's not going to knock you out if it falls off the shelf. So you you will be able to approach this with a, in a more reasonable amount of time. Thank you for uh, for bringing it up there, Peter. I I um, it's it's author. Yours truly is as unworthy as ever, but I do feel like this is is the best, the most effective introduction yet to the divine will. And as we talked about in our last episode, and I'm sure it'll come up again today, it's all about the will of God. Everything that we're talking about, everything we're striving towards, is summed up in those words right there. Just Thy will be done. We're striving towards the accomplishment of God's will on earth as in heaven and the preparations for seeing that realization yeah they're going to be a bit painful as all good things are but it'll be worth it so we're going to talk we'll we'll see how much we have time to get through today maybe if we don't get through it all we'll we'll have another show uh in the in the future but um we're going to talk about what we uh what what's in store for the accomplishment of god's will on earth as in heaven as he promised in the greatest prayer ever prayed. Well, Daniel, I have a question, too, because I haven't had a chance to uh, to get through your other book. I mean, it is long, and there is an I audio. forgive you. And there's an audio <laughs> version to it, right? Is it, you can get the, the Oh, the long. short. I don't have that at, at, on my desk right here, but okay. yeah, the, 
So there's the the short one, Crown of History, the really long one, Crown of Sanctity, and then the medium one, my new book. So I recommend okay. the medium one. I will so, be done. Okay, but the so short what, one as an audiobook. Okay, so what distinguishes this book from the other ones? Like if you had to pick of all these works, I mean there's the, of course there's mm -hmm. the 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 works that are all the 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 I don't know what you call it, the teachings or the 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 messages of of Louisa Picaretta given to her on the divine will and then the crown of sanctity and you have this one if somebody were to be jumping into this for the first time saying i've never even heard of this but it does sound really interesting where should i start where where should they start thank you that's that i mean that's that's the most pragmatic question here so i should answer that more often if they're catholic this without question this is if you're catholic if you want to give if you want to introduce a catholic to the message this is where to start thy will be done um and um this is, as I always say, and I really mean it, if I say anything good, it's only because I quote holy people because I'm not holy, but I, I, I know who is holy and I know who to quote. And this is just utterly filled from the first page to the last page with references to those who we should be deferring to already anyway, completely aside from anything Jesus said to Louisa. And um, this really, I, I don't think that any Catholic in the face of the planet any serious Catholic on the face of the planet could could read the references I have in here and fail to recognize the reality of this message of the fulfillment of the Our Father prayer. If they're not Catholic, then I recommend having them start with the really tiny book, The Crown of History. I tried to write that with the broadest appeal possible. So any random person off the street if that's what you do, you hand books to people on the street, the really tiny one, Crown of History. If it's someone who's already Catholic, my most recent book, Thy Will Be Done. Awesome. And then the Crown of Sanctity, the huge one is there as kind of a reference work when you need it to, to look more deeply into something. And it's still online, too, if people wanted to hear the audio yep. version of the Crown of Sanctity. So that's something you could always just play, right? The... Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm confusing people. The Crown of History, the really small one, has a free audiobook, yeah, okay. on YouTube. And the Crown, okay. the really big one, has a completely free uh, PDF on my website too. Great. Well, maybe there'll be an audio version of that as well. Um, I'm working on an audio. I, I hope to have soon have an audio version up of my new one that I will be done. That's will take a little longer, but I'm working on it. Well, I'm going to be the voice of it. So just as a spoiler. I will yes, be done right, right. by Daniel O'Connor, <laughs> read by Peter Howard. Peter <laughs> Confuse <Hensley>. everybody. <laughs> um, so, Daniel, how would you uh, summarize like the significance of of this work and this message for right now? There's lots of things. I mean, I when I'm in my Catholic circles, you get inundated with wonderful Catholic devotions, and check this out because they're and they're always in the context of in the times in which we're living. We need to rediscover Our Lady of the End Times, or uh, or, or something else, and you, know, you can have a lot of these wonderful things. But what makes this particular message of the Divine Will stand out from the others? It's it's putting the absolute essence of our faith under a microscope. And that's, by the way, what the Church teaches is, is the purpose of private revelation. It's not to add to public revelation. It can never do that. But it can render explicit what is already, what, what is only implicit in public revelation. And if you, the public revelation, the Bible, because I have so many Bibles, I don't know if one within reach right now, but the, the Bible is itself thousands of pages, depending upon formatting and font size. But um, what is its own core, its own essence, its own kerygma. I would argue that the essence of public revelation is Jesus, the only prayer that Jesus ever taught, the Our Father. And that begs the question, what is the essence of the Our Father? And that's what I really tried to focus on in this book, building from the very foundation upwards. I don't, I don't even bring up Louisa's, Jesus' revelations to Louisa until part four of this five-part book. So the majority of this book doesn't concern itself with, with, private re, with those private revelations at all. It's just building from Jesus' words in the gospel through sacred tradition, the fathers of the church, the saints, the doctors, the great mystics of the 20th century like San Faustina and Blessed Conchita. So really, no Catholic in the face of the planet should have any problem realizing the call 
that Jesus is giving us through his public revelation, his God, his, so he sent his spirit to the church, of course, at Pentecost, and that Holy Spirit guided the church through 2,000 years of sacred tradition. We don't, you know, as Catholics, there's too many Catholics out there who, who look at the Bible and they think, okay, that's where all the important stuff happened. And then when those events ended 2,000 years ago, it, we started the time of just sitting around and waiting for, for the second coming at the end of time to put us out of our misery. No. Church history, the salvation history, which is depicted in, in the times of the Old Testament and everything, that's, that's the prologue to church history. Not vice versa. It's not that church history is the epilogue to that. Church history, the last 2,000 years, that's when God's been doing his most extreme work, I would wager, in his building up of the sanctity of the church. And we see that in the lives of the saints, in the teachings of the saints. And I've tried to trace that out in this book, starting with the Our Father in the Gospel. And I just, I think that a lot of Catholics don't realize how extraordinary that prayer is, the Our Father. But the Catechism makes it completely clear. And that's why I started this book, part one, um, with emphasizing what our faith teaches us about the Our Father, that it's the, and I'm just looking at a couple quotes here from the very beginning of this book, that it's the fundamental Christian prayer, the quintessential prayer of the church, that uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, the great theologian, called it the most perfect of prayers. So my thesis is very simple. In the quintessential prayer of the church, the most perfect of all prayers, we dive into the very heart of that prayer and we find the essence of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a Catholic. We find the essence of our own calling and we even find the blueprint of history itself. And that essence is, well, in the words, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I could have called this book "Thy Will Be Done on Earth as It Is in Heaven," but instead I shortened yeah, it to just long, "Thy yeah. Will Be Done." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I like the I like the shorter version. Yeah, the, you know, less is more on the on the book cover. It's right, interesting right. as you were talking about that, <clears throat> and a couple thoughts come to my mind. One of the one it was just a question, and this this ties into so many different things, like the messages of Marian apparitions and, and and saints of the last few hundred years um, that have brought to the to the forefront of the church's spiritual and intellectual reflection, things that the church has known for 2,000 years. But here we are at the, you know, 2,000 years later, and we're focusing on the meaning of the Our Father. Rather than seeing it as a big return to the beginning versus like, why do you think that that's so significant now? I mean, have we missed it for 2,000 years, you know? Um, and and, and yet, the second thought was, I, I, I thought of that, um, it's a quote I use all the time on um, St. John Paul II, where he says that we, we're now living in the final confrontation, and it's between mm -hmm. Christ and Antichrist, church and anti-church, the gospel and the anti-gospel, and really, it's, it, it whittles down to the kingdom of Christ versus the counterfeit kingdom of Antichrist. And so I'm sort of almost thinking as I go, but it's like my, what inspired me as you were talking what were, was that whole thing of, yeah, it's about the kingdom of God on earth versus the kingdom of Antichrist. And no, in, in, in no other period of history have we... Or, or, yeah, have, has the church experienced this confrontation like it has now? People say, oh, it's right. always happened in history. No, it has, of course. It's, it's, right. it's a constant perennial thing. But now it is it is the final battle. The, exactly. the global scene is set. And so it is. it seems very fitting that we focus, that we're being drawn to focus on the Our Father. What are your thoughts as, as I share that? Does that resonate at all? Or my I mean, my way just, off? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> And we didn't talk about we didn't talk about any of this before, so this is just spur of the moment as the spirit leads us. But that's exactly where we are now. We, of course, throughout all of history, we've had this conflict between the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of and spirit of Antichrist. But that conflict is reaching its superlative moments right now. And I'll get to the Our Father as what you said about the Our Father in a moment. But 
and and this maybe this is quoted too much these days. Maybe everyone who's watching this has heard this already. But as servant of God, Sister Lucia of Fatima said, the final confrontation. And I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember it exactly. But the final confrontation between the kingdom of Christ and the Antichrist will be over marriage and the family. That's what the servant of God, Sister Lucia, said of Fatima. So you can't imagine a more pronounced conflict bet between the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of Antichrist over marriage and the family than we have today, in 2000, the end of 2021, where the, um, the, the most perverse sins are now, are now included in the definition of marriage and where that is increasingly infecting the church herself. And Jesus promised to St. Peter, the gates of hell will not, pre will not prevail against the church. So we, we can rest assured that, this, that these errors will never infect the magisterium itself. But look, just look around the, the, the church today. You can see that these errors are infecting so many faithful, so, so, so many of the faithful, so many of her priests and even bishops and even council, even national councils of bishops. We are at the supreme moments of that conflict right now. And, and yes, it's the other part of the Our Father, that I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a big part of why I wrote this book. I wanted to trace out through, and it's actually through part two of this book where I do this, where that paradigm of the accomplishment of God's will on earth as in heaven, this isn't something we just suddenly discovered is important, you know, in, in the 20th century with Jesus' words to Louisa, that this has been the paradigm of all of the most important developments in the sacred tradition of 2000 years of church history up until the present day. And it's like, if, if you zoom out and look at church at, at the, the most important developments of church history's sacred tradition in her spiritual theology, I wager, and I'm not a church historian, but I read the lives of the saints and I read the teachings of the greatest saints on our greatest mission, which is sanctification, salvation, sanctification. And I see in it, a progression, an ascendancy that, as I've said in the book, can only be compared to the crescendo of a classical masterpiece of deeper and deeper understandings of what is meant by the accomplishment of God's will on earth as in heaven until we see the pinnacle and the crown of these understandings suddenly exploding throughout the church in 20th century mysticism. And it's not just Louisa, it's tons of other mystics. It's like as soon as we hit this time with St. Therese of Lisieux, her life spanned this time period of preparation to completion. She was the, I wager that she was the final preparation in church history for this sanctity, that she both prepared for it and revealed it. And as soon as we get to St. Therese of Lisieux, we see this, these descriptions of this new sanctity of God's will being done on earth as in heaven just exploding throughout the mystics of the church. So I can't, I mean, I can't, Probably, I probably can't successfully summarize that in a few minutes, but that's what I try to, to show, not through my own argument, but just through as many quotes as I can fit within the pages I promised myself I'd obey when, before publishing this book, within the pages of parts one through three of the book. Hmm. Well, you're certainly setting up a lot of suspense for people to read it. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited to get my hands on it. And I'd probably be even more excited at the, when the audio version comes out because I'm more like an oral tradition person. As um, am I. As I've, am I. <laughs> I've read probably millions of pages of stuff over the years, but I'm a really slow reader. So, um, but anyway, you know, that's really interesting. As, as you're talking to, this is in, it's incredible how this is turning into a bigger reflection of things. And as a segue into the next point um, of, of our conversation here, my mind, as you're talking, went right to the temptation of Jesus in the desert and, and what Fulton Jean taught about that, his reflection on that, where the, it shows the three ways that the devil, how Satan will, uh, or tries to, to claim his counterfeit kingdom on earth. And the three temptations were... Like three shortcuts from the cross, as Sheen described it, and how the devil really is, uh, has been is most successful in accomplishing this enslavement into his kingdom versus the freedom of those who are in the kingdom of God, and how the first one was the um, turning rocks into loaves of bread, 
And he said, yes. Everybody has an id, as Sheen described it. If you feed that, they will follow you. Some, 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 for some people, it will be a natural hunger, of course, but there's a sex instinct, there's a lot of things. You feed that, and they will follow you. And that's what Satan's telling Jesus, is that if you, you know, you feed, fill their bellies, and they'll follow you. So what do you think mm -hmm. the devil's going to want to do? He's going to want to, of course, create an environment where um, he becomes that savior, you know? And yet Jesus' response is not on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then, you know, the next one is uh, throw yourself down, perform wonders and people will follow you, technology. You know, and then the last one is, uh, you know, that they're, they're all my, all these kingdoms are mine. And if you bow down to me, I'll give you everything. I see that's exactly where we are right now. The agenda of Satan has been exactly these things to move us from even thinking about God's kingdom and his divine will to the immediate things of this world, what's going to keep me safe, secure, whatever it is, and we're willing to not bow down to God and trust in Him or even think about like what may His will be, but it's, well, Lord Fauci says this, or the CDC says this, or the whatever it may be, you know, the World Economic Forum says the following thing, and they're promising all of these things, if they'll, if we'll just mm -hmm. go down and bow down to them, and I, I'm kind of getting a, a little bit ahead of myself, but I just see that as we're stepping back and analyzing the signs of the times at this very moment, at the end of 2021, going into 2022, I just see this moment in history as 2022 being the the year of of the great decision that we mm -hmm. must make, and it is. Whose will will be done? And, Whose will will be done? And I feel, I, I get, I, I don't say frightened by that, but so many have, have made so many major choices in their life already in this last year under fear, which is the tactic of the devil, you know, fear of not being able to have food, fear of not having access mm -hmm. to society, fear of all these kinds of things, and they... They say, okay, I'll, I'll do whatever is told to me, and not even questioning what it is. And, you know, and, and now we're transitioning into the year of what are the consequences of that? And w w where, where's the f where, where are the final battle lines going to be made? And yeah, I mean, the infrastructure of the Antichrist has been set up the past couple of years with COVID. You, you've described it well. This this pseudo church through the world's response to COVID it's, it's been a pseudo antichrist church has been established. And I'm not saying the antichrist himself is out there yet. He's not <laughs> He'll probably be soon, but a parallel magisterium, I think is a way to describe what you were just referring to there where the, the authentic magisterium is Catholics. We of course recognize there is such a thing as a set of teachings that has divine protection. And when we read it, we don't need to debate about it and research it. And, and we just know it's true because Jesus said to Peter that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Therefore, whatever would, const whatever would be that can't happen. Therefore, mm -hmm. the church's teachings are true. But we have this parallel false antichrist magisterium, which is called, which is the mainstream narrative, right? And you're not even allowed to question that for a moment in the secular world and increasingly even in the church. You do? What, and what happens if you question that? You're a heretic. Mm. You're burned at the stake. You're deplatformed. And while, while the authentic magisterium, uh, you know, the, the devil always apes the things of God. So we can, we can bank on everything in the authentic church being aped in this antichrist system that we're seeing just being built before our eyes. And yet so many people prefer to pretend that ignorance is bliss and then pretend to not see what's happening right before them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, mm -hmm. you know, you wrote a, uh, uh, one of your last blog posts of this year, the second to last one on December 20th, that I, I really found very valuable. And uh, I'd like to uh, 
really use what we've just been talking about as a springboard into it because you you have a it's called a you call it a prophecy roundup on the threshold of the three thirds. Uh, well, you can explain the three thirds in just a second. <laughs> the three thirds, but, but you really do cover the main things that um, I think every Catholic should have an aware a, 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 a mature awareness mm-hmm. of um, because we're at a point where the decisions that we make aren't minor and they affect the people, not just ourselves, but the people we love, the nations in which we live. And the, and, re, and I'm not downplaying, the future of humanity itself. Like, this is an all-out, full-court press right now of evil against good, especially because there is the beginning of what I consider a, a great awakening, which will be taken to a whole new level when the what we, what's called the warning or the global illumination of conscience takes place, and we'll, we'll be talking a little bit about that as well. Um, but these these are things that I think are, I, every Catholic should be aware of, and and I'd like to get your you know your comment on uh, as many points of these as we can because all of these are I think are just really good um, launching points for for conversation, um, and, and and also if if some of these things do come true. We need to be, we need to be reacting right now. It almost feels like we're, you know, like when I like sports. So like when you're watching like a, a soccer game, and you know the game ends, but the referee has been keeping a clock all throughout, and he has what's called injury time, and you don't really know how much that is until eventually they kind of figure it out and then they put it on the bottom of the screen, and it could be ten minutes, it could be two minutes, whatever it is. But I feel like we're we're entering into that time. It's like the game. The you know re, um, what do they call it the uh, not the regular season but like the game clocks is basically over and we're like you know we're in this injury reserve time and we bet and we have to we've got to win <laughs> we got to like, what I mean by win is we need to get ourselves right with God right now and so. I don't know. Why don't you take us through it a little bit, uh, your blog post? I mean, first off, what is sure. you said the threshold of the three thirds? I uh, had never heard that well, before. I, yeah. So. I just kind of made that. Yeah. Well, I, first of all, I learned something today because I, I knew nothing about choose to be happy. I like that, that little message there. Um, <laughs> I just, just saw that in your mug. Uh, I, I don't know nothing about injury time or soccer, but, but it sounds like an apt analogy for where we are today because. Let me actually let me just first of all say I do not know the future. I am speculating here. But Jesus rebuked the Pharisees, didn't he, for failing to heed the signs of the times. And I think we may have even mentioned this in the last episode. Like they 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 can look at the clouds and they can get, take a guess as to what the weather will be, but they fail to look at the signs of the times. How lamentable is that? Jesus essentially tells the Pharisees, he condemns them for that. So let's not be like that. Let's not just bury our heads in the sand and refuse to look at the signs of the times. And yes, I'm speculating. I don't know the future. It's always possible that God will extend the time of mercy. That's always his sovereign right. I don't know. But why do I bother speculating? Because by considering just how very likely it is that we are nearing the apocalyptic events, that inspires us to be more bold in the mission. That's the only reason I bother with this eschatological speculation about about the possible timing of things, because by considering the very real possibility that we are very close to the end of the present era, that inspires us, that should inspire us, to be more bold in the mission of salvation and sanctification that God has entrusted to us. And we'll get to some of the details of that mission, hopefully before we run out of time today. But that's, I'll just say that now, that's why, that's why we're bothering with this for the sake of the mission of salvation and sanctification. So yeah, I'll run through a few things here that the, the, the threshold of the three thirds, I just think that this is interesting and I'm not a numerologist. I don't pretend that these elements of, of looking at the numbers, prove anything, but I still think they're worth looking. I still think they're worth considering. Three is like the most important number, isn't it? Three persons in one God, you know, that's that's um, very significant. So we're obviously in the third millennium and we're in the third decade, you know, the first decade of the third millennium started in 
in uh, the, fir- the year 2000, depending upon how you want to measure it, then the two- 2010, the second decade. So 2020, we're in the third decade. But now as 2022 starts, we're starting with the third year of the third decade because most people will measure it from 2020. So 2020, the first year, 2021, the second yeah. year, 2022, the third okay. year. If you want to be a real stickler, you say that the third decade started in 2021, whatever. Most people will say we're at the th- at the third year mm-hmm. of the third decade with the third millennium. I see. I think that's extremely significant. The three threes. So I think that if we look at the year ahead of us, I think God has extraordinary things in store. Again, speculation. I haven't received any direct revelations on this, but I think we can expect extraordinary things in mm-hmm. the upcoming year. Um, I wrote a blog post back in 2018, and you can Google it. You can look up Daniel O'Connor 2022. In 2018, I speculated. I said right there in 2018, not because not because there's anything special about me. There's not. Not because I have any revelations of my own. I don't. But just because I've read the prophecies out there, I said, verbatim you could look it up on my blog in 2018 i said the prophetic consensus holds that in the following few years the world will more or less completely fall apart that's what i wrote there in 2018. uh guess what's happened since 2018 the world has completely fallen apart in a way that no one would have believed you if you described in 2018 no one would have believed you if you said in 2018 the things that would happen starting at the end of 2019 into 2020 and 2021, and yet they happened. So guess what? If you were to right now describe what's going to happen in 2022, no one would believe you now because they never believed you before. They, the prophets are always burned at the stake, aren't they? Mm-hmm. And yet God sends the prophets. Why? He sends them, as it says in the book of Amos, I, the Lord does nothing without announcing it first to his prophets. He sends them before because he wants to bolster our faith in the divine nature of what has transpired by our recognition that it was foretold beforehand. I'm going to get to one very important aspect of that in a moment. But for now, we can look at just how many signs are converging before us for the upcoming year, and it's really extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Um, one, One major aspect of that is about Moscow. Um, and, you know, I've been talking for a while. Before I talk more about the details of that, is there anything more you wanted to say about what I've no, talked about No, I think that's great. I mean, right bit. now, and then looking at what you discussed in your blog post as well, you know, there's a, there's a, some key events that have been prophesied, one of them being this warning called, you know, it's a different names, Global Illumination of Conscience. And why that's so significant, too, is because it, it, the timing of that will come, at least as we're going to look at with some, for some of the quotes that you have here, uh, there are certain markers that kind of indicate that it's it's coming as imminent. And these signs you know, are converging. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so, uh, and the warning is, as I've always understood it too, from various saints and mystics, and is that it really is it's God's last ditch effort to call humanity back. And Sorry, I'm bending over here to try to get have a book, and I oh, that's okay. I can't reach it. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but there, yeah, Christine yeah. Watkins wrote a book about the warning that summarizes a bunch of the the prophecies. Right. And, and we've had Christine on in the past to discuss that. Um, but now, because of these events that you mentioned in your blog post, for example, you know, Moscow and 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 um, this potential, and it seems to be increasingly probable, uh, meeting in in Russia with Pope Francis and the, I think it's the Patriarch of Russia um, and the Orthodox Church, and even, I think the invitation has come even from, uh, from Putin himself, mm-hmm. that, uh, that according to one of the uh, alleged apparitions in Garibandal, Spain in the 1960s, I think it was 1961 to 1965, um, the chief, I guess you're not the chief, but like one of the head, you know, of the, of the seers, uh, Conchita, had, as a young girl, spoken of events that would take place that would coincide with, uh, as a preparation for the warning coming very soon afterward. And one of them was that she said, looking at your 
your uh, blog post, that the Pope will go to Russia, to Moscow. These are her words. As soon as he returns to the Vatican, hostilities will break out in different parts of Europe. Well, if anybody even looks at mainstream headlines right now, regardless of whatever slants are there, there's a very sensitive situation right now between Russia and Ukraine, and Belarus now doing, mil I just, just today, Belarus and Russia working on joint military exercises. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then, of course, there's the invitation to go to, to, uh, to Moscow with Pope Francis. The meeting isn't set up yet, but it seems like it, it can keep going in that direction. It could be very soon. And with the way Pope yeah. Francis it works, it could be last minute and he's gone in a couple of days. I don't know. But it's interesting how, you know, the, these things really are coming um, together. And I don't know. I, I, yeah, and that's, well, that's ex the extraordinary thing here is just, you know, set aside for a moment whether or not you believe in the warning, whether or not you believe in Garibandale, the, the, the uh, inarguable facts of the matter are that this was said in 1965, that this, this girl <laughs> said that right. this extraordinary event would occur when the Pope goes to Moscow, and then when he comes back, hostilities will break out in Europe. That made no sense 60 years ago in 1965 when she said that. Like, first of all, uh, popes don't go to Moscow. They don't go to Russia. They don't go to Moscow. And what do you mean hostilities in Europe? But the, the, well, that ended with World War II. We're not going to have another one. Suddenly, right now, at the end of 2021, both are seeming, like, unavoidable. For, a, the Pope is... And we don't know the details yet, but I think just this past week, the Pope met with the um, the patriarch who organizes these things. I can't remember his name. I mentioned it in my blog somewhere um, that would organize the trip itself. The Pope met with him and they're settling like exactly when and where it's going to happen. So this is all this is 95 percent likely to happen. The Pope is going to go to Moscow, most likely. That's extraordinary. That alone is like a prophetic bullseye in a sense. The mere fact that that's planned, even though when it was prophesied, it seemed crazy. And now the prophecy also says the hostilities, and by the way, the warning is prophesied to hit when society has fallen apart through these hostilities. Probably mm -hmm. a third world war, that's not specific in the Garibandal prophecies, but that seems what is would be most likely. Some sort of major, huge conflict, the likes of which we haven't seen since the end of World War II. So, that same line from Conchita, the Garibandal visionary, is being fulfilled on both counts right now. And uh, it hasn't been fulfilled yet, but the preparations for that fulfillment are being laid out in front of our eyes. And I hope and pray that there's not a conflict, obviously. I, mm -hmm. hope that you, I hope that Russia doesn't invade Ukraine, but it's looking quite likely that they will. There's, you know, I don't know when you are watching this, whoever's watching this, I don't know what day or month or year it is, but if you hop on the news Right now, there's a good chance there's going to be yet another development saying, oh, it's looking like Putin's going to do it. <laughs> it's looking like he's going to invade yeah. Ukraine. And that's not going to be tolerated by the West, by NATO. It's going to be ugly. You know, it's the, the whole subject of Russia is a very interesting one. Um, and they're a hard group of people to place. And this particular thing really kind of threw me for a loop, just because... Um, our Lady spoke about in Fatima how in, uh, in the end Russia will be converted. And Fulton Sheen and St. Maximilian Kolbe both spoke that Russia was going to be one, if not the chief catalyst and instrument to help re-evangelize the world. So there might be a wild card in all of this. I don't know. I mean, like, Russia going to war with anyone is not going to be of benefit um, and I don't really know the, the, the cooey bono in that at the, in the end, you know, I've, the radar has always been on China, which is of course now the war with Taiwan is, 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 all, is increasingly imminent. You know, we forget about it, but that right. can break out at any time. Um, right. but I remember, you know, there's something that I'm going to pull it up on my own screen. You can't see it, but this is a quote from St. Maximilian Colby about Russia. And that makes me kind of think too, that maybe there's a wild card if Pope Francis does go to Russia, that it could divert maybe what Russia may do, but it may be what then sparks the real forces of evil, because Russia is more Christian, really, than anybody in the West. People need to realize that. They're coming back to God much faster than we are. 
even as Sheen prophesied. The same Maximilian Colby said, The day is not far off, nor a mere dream, when the statue of the Immaculata will be enthroned by her knights in the very heart of Moscow. Hmm. Um, and I don't have the exact... Uh, yes, I do. Here's, here's the quote from Fulton Sheen. Um, he says, When Russia does receive the gift of faith, its role will be that of an apostle to the rest of the world. It will help bring faith to the rest of the world. Why should it be the means of evangelizing nations of the world? Because Russia has fire. Russia has zeal. God could do something with the hate of a Saul by turning it into love. He could do something with the passion of a Magdalene by converting it to zeal. But God can do nothing with those who are neither hot nor cold. These he will vomit from his mouth. And so Russia is such an interesting wild card, you know, even in the world of prophecy. Um, if you've ever read the, the work by Yves Dupont, this is called Catholic Prophecy. Mm-hmm. It's about as basic as a book as you can ever find with like a comment on the front, which is another whole interesting mm-hmm. subject. <laughs> but these celestial things that are, you know, coinciding that God speaks to us through these and, and seems to even uh, will, will um, be involved with these other phenomena that's being prophesied, and I think even including the warning. Um, yeah. But anyway, so, but like, but uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, of course, you know, we, we're, we can say we're speculating, of course, but we're also trying yeah, to... Yeah, Rus- but Russia will be converted. I mean, that's been prophesied. It will be converted. That, that, and they're I, more converted like, than personally, the I don't, <laughs> that's the thing. They already are more converted in the West, and I don't see a need for a radical stance in this. You know, there's the raging debate. Was Russia consecrated? Was it not? But personally, I don't see a need for a, an extreme stand on that one way or another. Like, obviously, JP2's 1984 consecration was helpful, but we should do it again. Like, I don't see a need to... Like and Pope Francis did that, by the way. People don't realize that. In 2013, yeah, he, did it in, he consecrated yep. the world... And of course, yeah, I mean, the whole debate about whether it's valid, I think is ridiculous because Sister, we've, we've, Sister Lucia... Right. It's not a right. sacrament. The validity well, sister, is not... But she said it yeah. multiple, at least three times officially mm-hmm. that it was done. And like Our Lady accepted it. And yeah. she even said... And it, it was accepted. I mean, I think we should, I think it should be done again, as Our Lady said. I think it should be done with Russia named. And I think even more fruit will be born from that. Mm-hmm. And I think that Russia has started a conversion. I think it hasn't completed it. Uh, Jesus also told the servant of God, Luis Spicaretta, in, in the message from October 16th, 1918, that Russia will be converted, along with England and, um, and, and Germany. I'm just looking at the message. That's why I was looking around a minute ago. Our rosary friends would be really happy about here. that. <laughs> yeah. It's every, and well, in fact, I mean, th- those will come earlier in the process, but the whole world, of course, will, will be converted be, but for the era of peace at, at the very beginning or during it. I don't know. I don't know those details, but it will happen eventually. Um, so with Russia and the East in general, my theory is that just like in the biblical times, Israel was chastised when they started apostatizing, they were chastised by the East. I think the same basic dynamic is going to play out before us because the East today, but by the East, I mean like Asia part, you know, Russia kind of straddles East Mm -hmm. and West. They will not. They will not accept this gender ideology, this homosexual marriage stuff, mm-hmm. transgender stuff. They will not accept that. And they do have abortion, which is more evil in and of itself. Absolutely. So they'll be chastised also. But the, the gender ideology stuff, it's not as evil in and of itself as abortion, but it's even more perverse in a way. I, I, it's, it's hard to pinpoint. But because my theory is because the East will never fully sign on to this modern western liberal woke agenda of gender ideology and homosexual marriage they're going to chastise us i think that the east will chastise the west Mm -hmm. in what's coming just like the east chastised israel in biblical times and you can read that in the old testament so yeah i agree with you i think that russia is more converted than we are now i think they haven't finished their conversion yet and i think yeah we should i think we should pray for the pope to do the conversion as our lady requested by naming russia but um but they're going to chastise us and we trust in our riches and we're going to realize in the west by we i mean the west and i'm sure there's people in the east watching this also but um we trust in our gdp in america today because our gdp you know blows away all the other gdps we're going to realize just how little that means 
when World War III starts and China with 1.3 billion people is against us, <laughs> it's going to be it's going to be ugly. And that's just one aspect of the chastisements that are coming. There's going to be natural disaster, the likes of which the world has never seen. There's going to be celestial phenomena, as you said, with the just the, the cover of, of the Catholic prophecy book, everything. Everything's going to hit all at once, and your head's going to be spinning so much that if you don't have it on straight right now, you are not ready. Yeah. And, and, that, and that got real serious us. real fast. Well, that, well that's what else. <laughs> How could it not? You know, but I, I just gave a retreat in Aspen, Colorado, and, and one of the sections was just on Sheen as a prophet for our times. But I, one of the things I spoke about was like, God's been giving us the most extraordinary signs of heaven that if you actually step back and, man, and, and, and contemplate these things, like, wow, he's preordained these from the moment he created the universe, that these would be happening right now. And I don't know how familiar you are with that, but like, of course, we had the four blood moons that led up to mm -hmm. the year 2017, that biblically speaking, blood moons uh, are lunar eclipses, that's what they are, they're a the lunar eclipse, but of they turn red because of the atmosphere of the earth bouncing off onto the onto the moon but how lunar eclipses in, in the bible always spoke to the judgment of god's people israel and they fell and, and these four blood moons were two were on the feast of tabernacles in 2015 and 2016 the other two were on the um uh the feast of passover exactly on the feast of passover and then we had in 2016 in the middle of all this we had the um the total lunar eclipse in the United States. And that lunar eclipse also went over ancient Nineveh and over the United States. It's like, mm -hmm. that's what people say. Is this a sign of Jonah moment? They know that before mm -hmm. World War II, there was a, a, a total solar eclipse that took place what, what, that went over ancient Nineveh, which is Mosul, Iraq today, and went over Eastern Europe, where the war started, right before it happened. And then we had the Revelation 12 sign in 2016, going into 2017. I don't know if, you know, if you're aware of that. That just blew my mind. How over nine and a half months in the constellation Virgo, we had the moon, or we had, um, you had the planet Jupiter inside the, the, literally the womb of the constellation Virgo. And after nine and a half months, Jupiter moved out of the womb. And on that day, which was the... Um, it was August, it was, um, I think it was the Feast of Our Lady of Nock, August 21st. You had, um, no, that, that was the day of the solar eclipse, was August 21st. It was after, in, in September, like September 23rd. But anyway, the, regardless of that, on that day, <clears throat> when Jupiter left the womb, when the sun rose that day, you had the constellation of Virgo, Virgin, and above her was 12 stars, and the moon was under her feet. And Jupiter had just left her womb, representing you know, the king of the gods. And then, of you can't make this stuff up. I watched it happen. I even used my phone to like screenshot it when it happened. And God's speaking to us like everywhere, He's like shouting to us in creation. And I think that because that's been largely ignored, I mean, they're portents, I think. They always have been in the Bible of some sort. That when we don't, we're only going to listen when we're forcefully brought to ruins, and that's the that's mm -hmm. the that's what I think you're talking about too. Is you know, uh, and even Fulton Sheen he he talks about that. He says, "Pray to God that America is brought back to God, but not in the state of ruin." You know, yeah. we'll be brought to our especially knees one way or the other. We'll be brought to our knees, Ben. Especially here in New York, we can't see anything in the night sky because all I see is light pollution when I look up. So <laughs> I haven't been able to see any of these stars and Jupiter and stuff. But uh, but it's and so yeah, I I haven't followed the the star and planet stuff much, so I can't comment on that. But that sounds that certainly sounds um, portentous, if that's a word. Yeah, um, it is. That's it's, God is. I mean, He's using every way He can to reach out to us now. And only those who are willing to, to look will see it. But with, with um, you know, goodness, we don't have too much time left here probably, but there's so many different things hitting all at once showing us that the present era is ending. 
the world is not ending. There's a lot more that has, has to happen before the world ends and Jesus comes in the flesh to end it with his will above all has to be done on earth as it is in heaven first. Kingdom has to come in in its triumph first. So that's all coming. But Good Friday always comes before Easter Sunday, doesn't it? So the life of the church as the church teaches has to follow the life of her head who is Christ. Christ was crucified. Christ rose. And then what happened after that? Did he immediately ascend into heaven? No, of course not. He stayed on earth for 40 days. So the church is also going to follow that pattern. And I'm not saying the era of peace will be 40 days. I'm sure it'll be longer than that. I don't, I don't know how long it'll be. But the church is going to have her time of persecution, death, martyrdom, passion, and then her time of resurrection. So many prophecies have talked about the church going through her resurrection for the era, for the reign of the divine will, the coming of the kingdom, the Eucharistic reign of Jesus, the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, that that will be a resurrection of the church. And then, so that God's will can triumph, that, that, that era, that triumph, that reign will exist. We don't know how long, because if we knew how long, we'd know when Christ will come again. He said in the gospel, we do not know the day or the hour, so we don't know how long that'll be, but that corresponds to Christ's time of resurrected presence on earth before what we're ultimately, ultimately looking forward towards, our heaven. The, the ascension of our Lord into heaven, the, that will happen to the church as well. That corresponds to the end of time, his coming in the flesh, the last judgment, the general resurrection. That's our ultimate supernatural hope. So I, I didn't even really mean to go through all that right there, but that's kind of mm -hmm. laying out the, the basics of what's coming before us. But really the single biggest sign aside from Moscow and hostilities in Europe and and I mean, there's so much more that could be said about that, but probably the single thing that most clearly indicates that we're at the close of the present era is everything that's happening with the infrastructure of the Antichrist being laid with what's happening in response to coronavirus, isn't it? I mean, that's... Yeah, well... What, what would you say about that? <laughs> right is right if nobody is right. Wrong is wrong if everybody is wrong. And believe me, in this error-infested world, what we really need is a church and an authority that is right not when the world is right, but one that is right when the world is wrong. Never in history has the prayer of the rosary been more needed to save our families, our countries, and defeat the evils of the world than now. The Fulton Sheen Institute worked closely with the Roma Rosary to develop the most unique, beautiful, and meaningful rosary that was inspired by Fulton Sheen's World Mission Rosary. This special handcrafted rosary continues Sheen's passion to support the mission of the church to evangelize the entire world. Each decade of the rosary has a different color, which corresponds with a different continent. Yellow for Asia, red for the Americas, white for Europe, blue for the nations of Oceania, and green for Africa. Each Fulton Sheen Aroma Rosary comes with a set of four pure essential oil blends that have been chosen for their therapeutic and theological significance. These blends correspond to the four mysteries of the rosary. Simply choose the oil for the mystery of the day, drop a small drop in the palm of your hand, and massage the oil over the surface, being sure to catch the lava beads. You're good to go and your prayer will linger longer with these beautiful aromatic notes. Every Fulton Sheen Aroma Rosary you purchase supports our mission to fight the battle for the hearts and souls of the Christian family and lead our world back to God. So visit the Fulton Sheen Institute's store and pick up your beautiful Fulton Sheen Aroma Rosary today. Get one for you, your family members, and your close friends, and don't forget your pastor. Thank you so much for your prayers and your support.